when we see patients, I think one of the questions they often ask is, is what are my risk factors? You know, where, what, what, how likely am I to have my disease progress over what time frame? And I think you know, it's a difficult question to answer broadly because it's different for different patients. And, and we certainly know from, from a lot of the great work that was discussed at this meeting, kind of the different biological implications of what drives progression. But clinically, what do we look for in these patients? And I think you know, there's two key progression events that occur, right? There's progression from the chronic phase of the disease to myelofibrosis, so ET or PV going to myelofibrosis. And there's also the progression to acute leukemia, which can happen from either ET, PV, or from myelofibrosis. And I, I look at those as very separate events, right? I, to me, to some extent, the progression to myelofibrosis is a natural history of the disease. You get this ongoing persistent inflammation that ultimately leads to a more inhospitable bone marrow environment, increase in scar tissue, fibrosis, inflammation, and ultimately that's what we get with myelofibrosis. Now, some patients get that after ET or PV. Some patients present with primary myelofibrosis. But when we look at patients that, per, that go from having ET or PV to myelofibrosis, what we often see is it, it's a change in the allele fraction of the driver mutation, or it's just duration of disease. And so when the studies have looked at this, we do often see, at least from ET to PV, you're seeing an increase in the allele fraction. So the JAK2 mutation per se is going from 15% to 25 or 20 to 40. And when you look at the, the, the genetics, the cytogenetics, you often see uh, trisomy 9 or uniparental disomy of the ninth chromosome, which ref reflects an extra copy of the mutated JAK2. Now, when you see progression to myelofibrosis, you know, I mentioned that it has to do with the JAK2 allele fraction, but it's not necessarily a change in that number. It's people that start with a high JAK2 allele fraction. So it's those people that have a high burden of disease, increased inflammatory signaling that's likely to, to contribute to that disease progression. Oftentimes, studies don't necessarily show that, maybe because they didn't look at that, especially older studies that didn't look so much at JAK2 allele fractions. But what we, what we see consistently is a trend towards higher white blood cell counts, or leukocytosis. And that seems to very nicely correlate with JAK2 allele burden. So it may just be a surrogate for, the, a surrogate for the underlying genetics of the disease. Separately, when we look at a transition from myelofibrosis or ET or PV to acute leukemia, I look at that as a much different uh, experience, right? It's not necessarily a change in the driver mutation. Oftentimes, these patients are acquiring multiple different mutations or more cytogenetic abnormalities. It's really genetic instability that leads to this more cellular immaturity, increase in blasts, and ultimately acute myeloid leukemia that's such a challenge to treat.